starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2019 New England Greenhouse Webinars. My name is Jeffrey Jewe from University of Massachusetts Extension and my co-host today is Ryan Dixon from University of New Hampshire Extension. The webinar is a series, the webinar series is a collaborative effort of UMass Extension, University of Connecticut Extension and University of New Hampshire Extension and is sponsored by Sangro Horticulture and Blackmore Company. The theme for the webinars is Growing Healthy Roots and the title of webinar today is Root Bond Pathogens and our speaker is Dr. Rosa Rodales from University of Connecticut. If you have any question during the webinar, please type it on the question box at the end of the webinar and we'll read the questions and provide the answers at the, after the end of the webinar. After the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please complete the survey before exiting the webinar. Before I hand over the controls to Rosa to move on with the um, webinar, I would like to mention that the recordings of the webinars will be uh, posted on the UMass Extension Greenhouse and Floriculture website and the link is shown on the screen, uh, on the bottom of the screen. So at this point I'd like to pass the controls to Rosa so that she can continue with the webinar. So Rosa is all yours now. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Um, okay. So before I start, I want to make just a short announcement. I would like to ask you to save a date for the Northeast Greenhouse Conference, which is going to be November 7 and 8. Uh, next week, we're going to finalize our program. So if you have any suggestions, please send those along to me and I'll make sure to pass them along to our board and, and see if we can make sure we include things that you're, you would like to listen to. So I'm going to talk about root diseases uh, and the title of what I promise is to talk about identification and control. So the way I always like to do presentations is I, instead of just giving recipes to people because recipes tend to fail, I always like to uh, provide more principles and tell you what are the things you need to look at, what to look when you, because if, if you have a recipe, but things don't go exactly like the recipe you're, you're trying to match it to, then it's very hard to troubleshoot. So we're going to talk more about the principles behind root management, root diseases, and how we can identify and control these uh, problems. Specifically, I organize the presentation in two ways. So I'm going to talk about disease diagnosis. I'm going to just give give you general recommendations of how you should be diagnosing a problem in your greenhouse. And then we're gonna talk about the disease triangle. And it's very important for us to understand that if we understand the components of the disease triangle, and we understand how those components can be managed, we can th therefore prevent disease. But we always need to keep that triangle in mind to understand why is it that those activities that we do matter. So just to put ourselves into context, the first thing is that we know that when we think about common root diseases in the greenhouse, we start by thinking about damping off, which can happen pre or post emergence. And you can see in that photo, we have some post emergent damping off um, combined with a little bit of pre emergent where you see that we have those plugs and the plants basically just damp off or didn't emerge, right? And damping off is something that be, can be caused by fungi, uh, such as Rhizoctonia, Alternaria, Sclerotinia, Fusarium, depending on the crop. Other fungi might be a problem, but in general, those are the ones that we think about. And then water molds are always one of the most important culprits that we think about. And Pythium Phytophthora, Pythium most likely in the greenhouse, Phytophthora a little bit more, more uh, predominant in nurseries. Root and crown roots are also an issue that comes very much associated to those uh, damping off pathogens. So very similar pathogens, but the symptoms are slightly different. And again, you can see on the slide there at the right, uh, those photos where that pathogen that started by infecting the root can also infect the stem and the crown of the plant. 
And then black root is also one that uh, it's a bit more specific, but we also tend to see in greenhouses a bit more often. So in general, these are the problems that we tend to look at. As you can see, most of the problems tend to be associated with fungi and water molds. Um, there may be some bacterial issues, but they tend to be more associated with um, where the plant tissue comes from. So right now we've heard a little bit about Santhemonas being a problem. So that's more of an issue because the cuttings came infected. So it's more a plant issue than a root issue, right? So, to, so, so as we talk, keep in mind that those are the diseases that we're trying to take control over, right? And then the general recommendation and the general thought you wanna keep in mind here is that all these pathogens are soil or waterborne. One of the things that I, I would like, like you to, to think about is, we're gonna talk a lot about water management. We're not gonna talk so much about soil management per se, because the assumption is that greenhouses tend to use fresh growing media. These fresh growing media is usually pasteurized. Um, in very few instances, there's been reports of diseases in growing media, but it's really, really rare. So if you start with fresh growing media, the growing media should not be the problem to begin with. So we will talk more about water because of this reason. So let's start by thinking about diagnosing the problem, right? So again, these are general rules that, you, that everyone should uh, have as part of your training. One of them is know what it's normal. So you don't wanna have someone who's really new in your greenhouse telling you that those poinsettias on the left look bad because that's just the difference in cultivar, right? So if you have a cultivar that's shorter, you know that it's normal that a cultivar looks shorter and it's not that it might have an issue, but it's just the cultivar is, has that characteristics. So start by knowing what is normal, right? And experience will give you that. And if not, well, you learn from your peers in the greenhouse. The other thing is to look for patterns. And, and by looking at patterns, we mean look at the patterns within the damage of the leaves, look at the whole plant, but also look at the patterns in the growing area. So the general recommendation is that if you see something that's uneven, where there's not a clear pattern of how those symptoms are coming, of where those symptoms are coming from, it's most likely a biotic cause. So the example would be if you look at the of that cartoon on the bottom, those three where you have all those legal patches, that's most likely caused by a biotic problem, either an insect, either a disease where things can move around and it's more kind of randomly where it landed, right? Some exceptions to this rule are diseases that come from, that are caused by viruses and diseases that are spread by vegetative propagation plants. So again, talking about the Santhemonas issue, it's more an issue that was spread because of vegetative propagation and we saw an even pattern of problems, right? But usually if the plants looks good and all of a sudden they start looking bad, and we have an even pattern, we think of them as probably caused by biotic cause. The other pattern you wanna look is, if you have something that's pretty uniform, you will think about, is my, fertilizer, is my fertilizer injector working? Did we apply PGRs? Is there cold damage? Is that pattern something that we look just at the margins of the greenhouse? So those type of things will help you also identify what might be the pro probable cause of the problem. And again, you can see the cartoon there on the top. When you see that something just occurs very specific on one side of the greenhouse, on one side of the plant, you can infer that, okay, it's most likely not biotic, but an abiotic cause. So this is an example. Uh, I wish I could hear you back so he, to hear your answer. So do you think this is biotic or abiotic? So you can see the spotty pattern, you can see um, some plants in the middle that are healthy, some plants that have seeds on the, in between plants. So of course this is damping off caused by a pathogen. In this example, we have a very clear pattern where the plants on the left look much smaller than those plants on the right. Um, and the problem here was caused by a spray of plant growth regulators. That was, one side was over sprayed so the plants didn't grow as well as the others. So the third rule for general diagnosis is look for signs and symptoms. This, especially when we think about signs, the signs is something that you require a bit more training, but the symptoms are something that you should all be familiar with. So when we talk about root-borne pathogens, 
you always want to look at the roots. And even if you think that your plants look well, you still want to get your container and look at those roots all the time, right? You want to make sure that you have a, a nice distribution of white roots, that you have fine root development, and that it looks like the crop should look by the stage you're looking at them. That example there is a very classical symptom of pithium root rot. If you see, if you pull the, the, the root, the, the, you will see that when, when you clear that root, the cortex will remain there. And the symptom that you're looking at is something that we call a rat tail. So it's a very classical symptom of pithium infection. So that's an example of a symptom that you can look at if you see root necrosis. If you don't see that, then it could be caused by a different pathogen, like the fungus we mentioned earlier. I was trying to think if there are any root diseases where we would see a sign. And I couldn't think of any other than probably nematodes. Some of them you could see with your uh, magnifying glass, but I don't think uh, in general you'll see many signs of the pathogen with root pathogens. But as an example, you can see that uh, rust is something where you see the spores on the foliage. And a lot of the foliar diseases, you can actually see the signs with the magnifying glass. Some of them you can see just with your naked eye. Very important is that um, matching especially the signs is something very difficult if you don't have a trained eye. So one of my recommendations is to match those signs to a known reference. There are very good books out there on annuals, perennials, or whatever it is that you're growing. So I suggest getting one from a good source. There are a lot of online resources that are good as well, but you wanna make sure that it's a resource that you know that it comes from someone who was well-trained. And I'm gonna give you some references at the end of the presentation. And another thing that you can do in-house when you're thinking about diagnosis is there are, Adia has these kits that you can use to test for virus. There's a few bacteria that you can also use when it comes to root pathogens, there's also, I think, tests for Phytophthora and Pythium. So you can use those as a reference as well. Um, not everyone has it, but if you have a, a place where you, you have a tendency to have problems and you want to make sure that you're not shipping samples, that you're not, sorry, that you're not shipping plants with disease, it's, an, it's a good way to get your, your plants tested before you ship them to your clients. And finally, we're lucky that we grow our plants in greenhouses, so we have some luxury. Um, so again, as a diagnosis tool, you want to think about what are, was, was the greenhouse too hot? Did the temperature in the greenhouse drop? Was the greenhouse too wet? Or all those conditions are part of what you use to identify what's the potential cause of your problem. Because if you know, oh, the greenhouse, the temperature dropped very low, the plants were really wet, and two, and, and two days later, we have all this fruit rot, you know that that's associated with probably pithium infection. Um, so you want to make, make that as part of your diagnostics tool. Um, so going back to the example of damping off, right? So putting things together of what we just mentioned, we see this pattern where we have plants have this irregular pattern, you see some patchiness, you see plants gone, um, it's something that can have happen at the seedling stage, seedling rots. You can see plants getting wilted post, um, post emergence. You can see that there's a radial distribution most of the time for, for damping off. Uh, not all the time, but so, what, as the disease progresses, you will see that going forward. Um, so if you're in your greenhouse, you can say, okay, I have damping off. But do you know if it's rhizotonia or do you know if it's pythium? it's unlikely that you will know it by just doing what I mentioned before, unless you have your idea test. So that's why the, the last recommendation is to keep in mind that something that looks the same might be caused by different pathogens. And those pathogens, for example, we're gonna to talk today a lot about pithium and rhizoctonia, uh, they need to be treated differently, when, especially when we talk about chemical treatment. So you want to make sure that you're 100% sure that uh, the symptoms that you're looking are matched to the organism that's causing the disease. So for this reason is that your final uh, diagnostic rule should be to confirm your diagnostics with a professional, right? So here in the Northeast, we have a few uh, diagnostics lab. 
all of them are very well uh, equipped and all of them have been working very closely with greenhouses and ornamental growers. So find whichever works well for you and just make sure that every time you have a problem, you can just send a sample, submitting a sample in most of these labs. I checked a few of the prices. And for when you send a plant tissue, it's usually around $10. So it's an inexpensive way to fix a problem and catch it earlier, right? So with that said, we're gonna move now to the disease triangle. And that with the disease triangle, it's really gonna be the core of what we're gonna talk about today. So the disease triangle, we know that in order for disease to happen, three things need to be present, right? You wanna have, you should have a susceptible host. If a plant is, if you can have the pathogen and you can have, let's say, a lot of what conditions, but if the, if the host is not susceptible to the pathogen, you're not gonna see disease. So the plant has to be susceptible. The pathogen has to be present and not only present um, a low amount, but usually it requires certain concentration of that pathogen to increase over time. And then environmental conditions that favor for disease to occur. So when all these three are together, we end up seeing disease. If one of those is absent, disease will not occur. So think about this when you're thinking about how you're managing your plants. Which one of these are the ones where you have the most control, right? Susceptible host, we may have control, we may not, most likely we don't. Pathogen, we have some control. and environment, we have a lot of control. So we wanna focus on thinking about disease control in that way. So first we're gonna talk about, about susceptible host. We don't have much to say about it other than when there are resistant varieties available, you should always prefer those over susceptible varieties. In this case, we have New Guinea patients. A few years ago, we heard a lot about downy mildew being an issue in patients. We know that New Guineans are resistant uh, to impatience. So instead of just planting sensitive crops, we move into planting something that has a, a, some, some sort of tolerance and prevent problems because you don't want to have a weak plant in your greenhouse. So that in order to identify whether a plant is has some sort of resistance, that's usually the role of the seed companies. They tend to be very good at identifying and high, highlighting those plants that have some sort of resistance. Um, with that said, there's never a guarantee that a plant can turn susceptible over time. So even though the, the plant breeders make their big efforts on making sure that they're giving you a plant that's really resistant, uh, there's no guarantee that it's gonna last for 10 years, but it, that's a good place to start. So the second aspect when we wanna think about, again, keeping in mind that disease triangle is how we can prevent inoculum from entering and spreading in the greenhouse. So first of all, you want to prevent from it to even entering. So anytime you get new material, if you're not rooting your cuttings and your plugs, make sure that every time you get plugs from somebody else, you inspect their foliage, you inspect the roots, and don't bring them into your production area if you have not inspected those cuttings, right? The other place where we think about things entering into our operation is from our water. Um, if what we're looking at this slide is you can see the number of all my seeds or water molds uh, that are present, so meaning the number of species. So Pythium affinitrimatum, Pythium irregulari, those are different species. And we can see that if we have well water, the numbers are pretty low. But if you look at pond water, the numbers are very high, right? So you can see that there's always a lot of diversity of pathogens in pond water. It tends to be a richer water source. Um, and then you can also see that fungi, there's a lot of fungi that are present, and these are all plant pathogens that have been identified. And you can see again, pond tends to be a water source where you see a lot of those. Um, so again, that's why what, when we think about root pathogens and waterborne pathogens, it's water molds and fungi that tend to be what we wanna prevent from uh, having issues with. What you see here is, a similar story, it's just a different number, but the number is telling you how many reports are there in the literature where people have identified either water molds or fungi. Again, you can see that those numbers are very high. 
So if you start with having a water source that's either a pond or you're recycling your water, you know that you're at higher risk of having plant pathogens, right? So you want to think about how do I prevent from those pathogens to come in into my property? If you have well water, uh, even though you don't have a source of pathogens that's coming from your water, you still want to think about water management in terms of quality because you want to prevent pathogens from spreading from for perhaps a one in infected plant to the rest of your crop. So you still need to think about water management and water quality, even if you have a high, high quality water to begin with. So just a reminder why these pathogens tend to be a problem. Water molds, like the word says it, they are pathogens that grow really well in the water. The main reason is that they have this structure where the zoospores have this flagella that helps them actively move in the water. So those zoospores are that little cartoon you see on the right. So these zoospores actively search into the roots. They swim and they find the roots actively. They, they communicate through chemistry. And then the other thing is that other stages, uh, they will also attach to organic matter and that's how they move through the water, right? So they survive very well in the water. That's why they're so abundant in water sources. And then we see fungi. We have a whole list of fungi there as an example. These ones don't have a structure similar to the, to the zoospore that we're seeing up there. So they, they have some resting spores which can survive without need of having organic matter. But the general rule is that you will have fungal structures either inhabiting, oops, inhabiting the um, organic matter and that's how they will move through the water. Um, okay. So again, when you think about controlling waterborne pathogens, very briefly and very general, you want to start by thinking about removing organic matter from the water and also free organic matter in, in all the surfaces, but we're going to start by just thinking of the, of the water. And the other reason you want to think about removing organic matter is because uh, imagine if you're putting chlorine, the dirtier the water, the chlorine or whatever ingredient you're adding, it's going to react with that organic matter. So you wanna make sure that what, when you're putting chlorine, you're actually killing your target organism and not just letting it react with dirt or other uh, peat or growing media, right? So water treatment options are very broad. So it goes all the way from filtration, sporination, chlorine dioxide, copper, copper sulfate, hydrogen peroxide, slow sand filtration, constructed wetlands in ultraviolet. Um, we don't have time to go through all of those, but here are a few things you can take from these. One of them is that a single water treatment will not control all the plant pathogens. What you're seeing here is on the y-axis, you can see the concentration of chlorine growing from zero on the top to four at the bottom. And you can see the different pathogens at which there has been a reported um, range of control. So you can see that you need a lot of uh, of chlorine to kill some of the pathogens we've talked today, such as Fusarium or Septonia, so chlorine wouldn't work very well. But other pathogens, such as Pythium and Phytophthora, get controlled by chlorine. So take a message here is no technology will control everything, right? And just if you look at things the other way around is, what if I want to control a specific pathogen? What do we know about them? Um, so you can also look at things that way and say, I have a big issue with Phytophthora, what are my options? And then you can see that there are different options where we know a little bit and there's information out there. So I'll show you what source you can use to find more information. One of the issues with sanitizers that it's very, very important to keep in mind is that they, there's a risk of phytotoxicity if you don't use them right. Um, that's why monitoring the active ingredient is very important. So what you're seeing here in this photo is chlorinate, chlorine that was applied from zero going all the way to the right to 32 parts per million. The yet general target recommendation is to apply two. Sometimes growers apply more because they wanna overcome the sanitizer demand that comes from that organic matter or if they have dirty water like pond water, they inject a little bit extra. So you wanna make sure that even if you're injecting extra, what reaches to the plant, it's not too high. Because if you look at here, at four parts per million, we start to see plant declining a little bit. And when you go even higher, um, you can see that, and this is at, at continuous irrigation. 
you can see that the quality declines very significant. So it's very important to stay on top of whatever technology you choose to, right? Another way that we can work on reducing phytotoxicity risk is to reduce the concentration by increasing the contact time. So generally having something like a storage tank and letting that active ingredient react in the storage tank, but having a lower concentration tends to work really well as well. So very general here, we have uh, a water source. You, would, you should have filtration systems. Usually you want to start with something coarse, going to finer. Then you inject the chemical sanitizer, then you filter and then you irrigate and make sure that you're monitoring at every single stage, right? Um, to find more information about sanitizers and water treatments and which ones work for a specific problem, you can go to backpocketgrower.com, you go under tools and then select waterborne solutions. And there you can make your search by organism or, or by treatment system. And there you will find summary data of what has been published. So moving into other aspects on how we prevent inoculum to entering and spreading, we have that sanitation is very important. And sanitation includes surface sanitation. It includes no debris in the, in the growing area, but also make sure that weeds are removed uh, as soon as, as we can. Ideally, you, you wanna avoid growing on the floor. I'm gonna show you some slides on how splashing is a big issue. But if you can't grow, if, if, if you don't have an option, you can do things like this grower. You can see that he makes sure that he lifted the trays from the floor, they were not directly on the floor, but also he kept the area very clean, free of weeds, uh, as clean as possible, right? Um, so what's wrong in this setting? Again, this is something that I see a lot of the head growers getting really upset when they see it. You don't wanna have your hose in the floor because that's how you're uh, irrigating everything. You might do all your water treatment, but if there's debris in the soil, and then you're irrigating, you're spreading your pathogen. So something as small as making sure you're taking control of how you spread pathogens is important. And then the other thing is talk about preventive applications and product rotation. When we think about <clears throat> root pathogens, applying preventive applications of fungicides tends to work really well. That's not the general rule for uh, foliar pathogens, Polar pathogens, we do preventive applications if we tend to have a problem, but if not, we don't, right? So here are just some options um, that I pulled out from Dr. Mary Hausbeck's uh, website. She has done a lot of trials on what works and what doesn't work. So for example, here, when he, what her recommendation there is that these two products at the top are products that, she, that were tested by her program where they found that efficacy was really high. And the products listed under that red line are products that they found they would work if you don't have a high disease pressure. Similar with Rhizoctonia, you can see it's a different list of, of products. And that's why it's so very important that you identify what you're, what's causing the problem because you wanna match the problem to the right product. Again, those on top of the red line are ones that have been identified as having uh, good efficacy, those at the bottom are the ones that are recommended more if you don't have a high disease pressure, right? And, and, the, and the general tendency is to, to think that it's very hard to cure a plant, so it's most likely that you will end up um, trying to, to prevent from spread things from spreading. When we think about uh, other options, biofungicides tend to work well as well for root pathogens, and here is the list of the pathogen of the biocontrol products that they are labeled for both, for example, Pethium and Rhizoctonia, which are the ones we've talked about today. And you can see that you could apply these preventively. Um, and most growers tend to think uh, highly of some of those products. So you can, you can communicate among growers and see what works for others. Um, the other thing is, again, we have the, the, we're going inside the greenhouse, but in general, what we wanna think about controlling the environment is that anything that implant, impacts plant growth, it's gonna impact plant health indirectly, right? So you wanna make sure that you stay on top of nutrient management, you wanna avoid mechanical damage, insect damage, and you wanna promote good aeration. Um, maintaining good air quality is one of the most important things when we talk about disease and plant health in general, because you wanna make sure that there's not a lot of humidity in the air, that there's not water condensation in, on the leaves, you want to maintain a uniform temperature and you want to make sure that you are replenishing uh, or exchanging air during the winter months. Um, 
So I suggest that you just go to Google and type Yukon Greenhouse IPM, or you can go to the website that's listed there and go to Greenhouse Management and Engineering section, and you will find a lot more information about maintaining air quality. Um, I'm gonna keep going. I, I realize that I'm a little bit over time, but I'll, I don't have much left, so. Um, and finally, things like increasing spacing are very useful, avoiding overwatering. Most growers should have an, a watering training session, and that's one of the most difficult things to train new employees, but you wanna make sure that you have clear guidelines of what crops need more water than, than which crops, and make sure you're grouping them the right way. But watering is really one of the key issues to preventing root pathogens from developing and multiplying. And then avoid confounding factors like having algae accumulating. If you have a lot of algae, you have fungus gnats, those fungus gnats can eat spores and move them around. So again, you wanna stay on top of those things and prevent them. And the way you want to think about your greenhouse is uh, this is a nice image where you can see how pathogens move, how water moves if within, in this case it's a nursery, but how would water move within your greenhouse and how splashing or how soil and debris moves around. So try to make that image from your greenhouse and think about, okay, what are the point, points where I should be controlling things, where I should be making sure that I don't have uh, potential risk of pathogen from spreading. So the final message is, again, think about that disease triangle. Think about what are the aspects you can control. Uh, susceptible hosts, we tend to not have a lot of control there, but we do have a lot of power in how we prevent from pathogens from coming in. And in the greenhouse, we have a bit more power on how we control the environment. And make sure you are thinking about a preventive approach and not a curative approach because that always works much better. Um, make sure you get a copy of the New England Greenhouse Floriculture Guide. Those are the links where you can buy them online. Um, there's a lot of good information and there's, it gets updated every two years. So I highly suggest that you look for that. And then the other thing is make sure you follow the experts. Um, I work a lot with water quality. There's this website called Clean Water 3. They have a lot of good information on different aspects of water management. And then we have a very group, a very strong group of plant pathologists who keep doing research on new diseases and, and also do a lot of product trials. So I highly recommend that you follow them and, and you get their input when you have anything that is pretty abnormal. They, they tend to help people a lot. And with that, I'll just like to finish by saying that next week we'll have a little bit more about root diseases with Carrie Stafford talking about the practical aspects on how she applies fungicides and what has worked for her. And that's all I have. So for those who are still here, I'm gonna read some of your questions. Um, let me see. So, where can I find a quick detectors of disease? Oh, I think you're talking about Agdia. So the so the kits are are called are produced by a company called Agdia. So I'm typing that there. Um, so you can just go to that website and they are the suppliers. And the other question says I can affect the chlorine in the plants that are very susceptible plants. Um, so I, I, so I think the question is about chlorination being problematic for plants that are susceptible. So I don't know if there has been a lot of research looking at what are the different critical levels for chlorine. We've tested a few plants ourselves. A few people from the University of Wealth has also tested a few plants. And the general recommendation is that if you have two parts per million at the irrigation hose, uh, you should be safe for most plants. Um, as always, you wanna, if it's a new practice, a new crop, you wanna start small, but the general recommendation is that two parts per million should be uh, a good level. 